We're watching the impact of wild weather on commodities markets. European natural gas prices steadying as traders weigh the effect of heat waves and potential weather-related supply disruptions. We're also watching oil prices as the Atlantic hurricane season gets underway. Asian LNG also at a high point for the year on higher demand outlook. China, meantime, is accelerating new investment for LNG importing terminals. Supply is on its way, though. Bloomberg NEF's latest outlook sees a record number of projects coming online in the next few years. The black market may even add more supply, with Russia suspected of building a shadow fleet for gas. Let's bring in Bloomberg NEF's head of APAC Gas and Global LNG Research, Apishek Rohatki, and our senior energy reporter, Stephen Sepchinsky. Abhishek, let me start with you because you had that outlook report talking about potentially more supply coming up. How much more are we thinking of in the next coming years? Thanks for the question. So our estimates for LNG supply exceed the demand projections from 2027 onwards. And this is resulting in an increasingly oversupplied market by the end of this decade. Overall, we are expecting supply from operational under construction and expected projects to reach roughly 623 million tons in 2030. And most of this supply increase is driven by the projects in the US and Qatar. Then demand on the other hand uh, is only able to reach 560 million tons by 2030, which is roughly 10% lower than supply. However, we, we think that these incoming excess supply levels have been softened due to project delays seen across the various supply markets and sanctions on Russia are also constraining supply. Russia is assumed to have lower its output from 2024 onwards in our projections as compared to a no sanction scenario. And buyers may also hesitate to renew their Russian contracts expiring at the end of the decade and this has further weakened the oversupply levels in our coming uh, years. So, Abhishek, a couple of risks there, but as you say in your report, gas is looking to be possibly the last fossil fuel standing. What are the key factors driving the demand here? And as well, where are the key markets for that? So there are three key factors, we think, that are driving the LNG demand growth up to 2030. And these include decarbonization, infrastructure expansion, and lack of enough domestic gas supplies. Efforts to lower emissions are prompting various demand markets to move away from coal and leading to higher demand for gas in the industry and power sectors. In our forecast, China is said to be the biggest LNG growth market with increase happening across all the consumption sectors. And then in the emerging Asian markets of South Asia, Southeast Asia, we think India and Thailand will be leaders in raising the LNG imports. In India, infrastructure expansion is the key driver for demand increase in the city gas and industry sector. And in Thailand, we have lower domestic supply, which is supporting more LNG imports. For Europe, we are also expecting uh, gas demand to increase over the next two years because of lower coal generation. However, Europe is said to see a structural demand decrease in power after two years because of the growth in the renewable generation sources. Stephen, I want to bring you in here because we just heard there that the, the fate or the outlook for Russian gas is a little bit in limbo with sanctions on the horizon. But your reporting says that there could be even more supply coming from Russia through this so-called shadow fleet. Yes, yeah, certainly. <clears throat> now, Russia's big plan is for, for, for the last few years has to boost the amount of liquefied natural gas, gas on ships, into the market um, because they lost Europe as the biggest customer of pipeline gas after the war in Ukraine began in 2022. Um, now, that has been challenging. Um, the, the expansion of their LNG exports is primarily through some, a project called Arctic LNG2. And the U.S. actually sh sanctioned it last year. Partners, including Total in France, Mitsui in Japan, have called force majeure on the facility because 
the ships can't come and pick it up. Actually, there are no ships available to pick it up because of the sanctions and other rules against the facility. So Russia is starting in the very early stage to do what they did with oil, which is to create uh, uh, what it appears to be a fleet of, of ships that could be described as sort of shadow in appearance in the sense that they're connected to companies no one's ever heard of and they could be doing something that could get them in trouble but if they're going from point to point let's say Russia to China uh, then it doesn't really matter now it's going to be hard Russia exports about 30 to 40 million tons per year of LNG. They want to get to 100 million tons per year uh, by 2030. But if their facilities keep getting sanctioned, that's really difficult. What's interesting is, instead, as Abhishek mentioned, instead of uh, Russia LNG uh, expanding over the next decade, instead, Qatar or the U.S. could take that spot and kind of um, force them, and not force them out of the market, but take customers that have, would have otherwise gone to Russia are now going to the U.S. and, and Qatar. So, Stephen, I guess in long term, the question is, if you have demand and supply booming for LNG, where does that put the energy transition? Well, it makes the energy transition difficult if LNG is too affordable to switch to renewables. I mean, I think when you look at the energy transition, uh, we're at Bloomberg, right? This is all about money. It's all about capitalism. It's all about price and price signals. So if renewables are the right choice, if it's cheaper to turn to renewables, wind, solar, batteries, maybe in the future, hydrogen, or even nuclear, then that will clearly help with the energy transition. You'll be able to get those zero carbon um, facilities online. But if this rush of LNG, if there's this really big glut, then, then emerging nations will increasingly turn to natural gas because it's affordable and cheap. Um, so there is a risk. If there is too much LNG, if the LNG market is flood, flooded, then that could make it uh, ch challenging to transition to cleaner sources faster. It's all a really fascinating story. Clearly, gas is part of that story. It's a bridge because when combusted, it, re it, it produces half the amount of CO2 than coal from power plants. But still, there are tricky issues like methane emissions, uh, which, which are ne we're now just trying to figure out how much methane emissions are affecting um, the total gas um, C you know, pollution, greenhouse gas um, profile of LNG. So all that together uh, is to say the more gas that comes into the market, it will be potentially challenging to quickly transition to zero emission generation. Mm. Abhishek, when it comes to Asian buyers, how dependent are we expecting them to be to the spot LNG market in the coming years? So globally, we are estimating that roughly 77% of the total LNG demand in last year was contracted under long-term destination-specific contracts. And we think that this is going to fall to only 61% by 2030. So most of this increase in uncontracted demand is coming from Asia, where demand growth will drastically outpace the new contract sign. Markets like South Korea, Taiwan, India, and Thailand are driving this increase. And these numbers suggest that Asian buyers may be looking to increase their spot share in the coming years with the hope of decline in spot prices. However, we think that spot prices will continue to stay volatile as there is a huge risk of supply project delays and sanctions, and hence buyers may want to balance these long-term and the spot volumes.